Realtree's Midwest Whitetail is brought to you by Cuddyback, America's Best Bowstrings, Drake Non-Typical, Easton Arrows, Frigid Forage, Fuse, Grizzly Coolers, Hoyt, and Realtree. I've had a few people reach out to me that wanted to see some of these deer and tell a story behind it, so we're gonna do that. We're gonna start out with one of the better ones, one of the best, actually. It's this buck right here on the left side of the fireplace, the chimney there. That's the jaw dropper two buck. We reserved that name for only some of the best deer I've ever seen, and the story to him started in 2012. I figured he was a three-year-old buck and I just started getting some trail pictures of him. He was a spindly deer, but real framey. Looked like he was gonna be a heck of a deer. Uh, one day in November, we had him come down. Uh, my brother was filming, come walking down to a water source, walked 20 yards, and just a beautiful buck. I knew he was gonna be something special. And then that late season, I filmed him one time as well. He was coming into the beans and the snow and passed him again. And 2013 rolls around, and we start running trail cameras. I guess it was maybe mid-July, and uh, he was one of the first deer that we got pictures of. And that's when he got his name, because I seen him, I mean, he was still growing. He was only, you know, he was just starting his threes and fours, I think, and they knew he was gonna be something special then. And I first looked at that trail picture, I was like, that's jaw dropper. And uh, he ended up turning into a heck of a deer, as you can see there. But 2013, we played cat and mouse with him most of November. I had him uh, one time with a doe just on the top side of a, oh, a little draw. We're hunting up on the top side of it, kind of the top of a ridge there. And he had a doe and there's a couple other little bucks in there. And he was all around me and I, I just couldn't get a shot at him that day. I think I had him to maybe 60 yards at one time. And another time he ran by about 30, but he was chasing a buck, so. Couldn't get a bow shot at him. And so most of November had gone by and I'd seen him several times. I was actually seeing him all the time. I just couldn't, couldn't close the distance on him or just get that perfect shot. And then uh, November 18th, I think it was, I was set up pretty early in an afternoon and I looked up and I saw him popping over the hill to a bean field. He was in the beans and he started marching straight at me. and. Uh, I just had a handy cam in my pocket, so I'm just filming him. Bo's still on the hook, and uh, he's just on a bee line for me. And I'm like, this is gonna happen. So he finally got down to about 80 yards probably, and I just took the camera and stuck it in my pocket so I didn't get the shot on camera. But sure enough, he walked in. He gave me a pretty long shot. It was about a 50 yard shot, but was able to make the shot and, and got him. He was, he's one of my best bucks ever. I think he uh, he grossed like right around 190 with a, his G2 was broken at the time. We've had it repaired, but he was around 190. He's, what he grew at the time was about 196 is what he is right there on the wall. Definitely a, a fun one to hunt because I was seeing him so much. He's uh, one of the best. So each week we'll try to dive into one of these bucks and tell the story to him. It's, been a lot of fun, a lot of memories, so I hope you guys enjoy it. Today we're going to be talking about TSI, or Timber Stand Improvement, as it's known. This is a perfect timber right here, primarily hickory. You can see when you look at the understory here, well there is no understory, and that's one of the problems. That's why you want to do a TSI a lot of times. It's just overpopulated, and if we knock a bunch of these trees back, we'll get an understory again. I want to show you the way I would mark this timber and the reason you want to do some of this and, and the things that I would cut, the trees I would cut. So let's go mark a little bit of this and we'll talk about it as we go. So like I said, this is primarily hickory. So I'm probably going to save about every oak in here. Of course, I like the deer and oak's a good food source, the acorns. Unless we've got an oak next to an oak that's overtopped really bad, you know, maybe you take an oak out in, in that scenario, but for the most part, any kind of a dominant oak in here, we're going to save, and the hickories will be the first to go. 
or a locust, something like that. And then if you get down to where it's all hickory, then you just pick your dominant hickory and then you save the hickory in that case. But right here we got a double oak. We would treat that. In this case, I would treat that as one tree. I would save both of those. You know, maybe I'd take out that little oak right there beside it. It's probably not going to amount to anything being next to this bigger tree. But let's mark a few of these. I mark the tree I want to save. I mark with a horizontal band. If I'm doing the cutting, I know what I want to cut, so I won't mark the trees I want to cut. But I will take out everything that's within about 10 feet of the crown of that tree. That'll give it quite a bit of room to expand, and then, you know, maybe you come back in five years and maybe you do some more stuff if it needs it. Um, if you've got guys helping you that are going to be doing the chainsaw, you can always mark the trees you want cut with an X. The ones to save with the horizontal band is the way some guys will do it. Here's a unique situation right here. You've got an oak that's competing with the oak that I just marked. So some of this is subjective as to what you want to do. You know, a guy could cut that oak or he could leave it. You could treat all three of these as one. In this case, this oak is quite a ways behind these other two. So I think I'm going to kill this one in this case and really let these two flourish. And then the hickory stuff around it will take out. There's a little oak right there. There again, it's competing with this oak back here. So in that case, I'm going to take out this little oak right here. Let these flourish that are right here. So that's why, like I said, if I was somebody was helping me, I'd mark that with an X. These hickories would all be gone. So I'll pick a tree about every 20 to 30 feet. That I want to do a crop tree release on and that's what you do in a, a timber like this is crop tree release you pick your tree you want to save and then release everything around it we've got another really good oak right there you want to pick your dominant trees you wouldn't pick a little oak like this and cut that one of course you pick your dominant tree and then clear out the stuff around it stuff around this tree everything within 10 feet of the canopy I would knock down let that oak flourish right there that's the dominant tree in here this hickory stuff is doesn't have much benefit for wildlife these are always going to be the first to go your oaks and your walnuts are the first to save and you just go down the list from there here's a good example of a hickory you would save right here so the only thing around this is hickory. You've got a dominant tree right there, a fairly straight tree. The next one you would save is over there is an oak. So I would save this hickory, clear out the hickory around it, and then go over that oak, mark that as a tree you would save. So this is a case where I would save a hickory right here. So mark that. And then the way you cut these, it's up to you, but there's gonna be some differences. You can either hinge cut it, or you can cut it off low. Um, I really like to cut them off at the ground level down here, but you gotta just keep in mind it's gonna take longer for that understory to really fill in versus hinging them up a little bit higher or you're adding instant cover. So you're looking at, if you're cutting them down low, probably four or five years to really get real good regeneration, a good understory. But now when you're doing that, you're also opening up the sunlight you know, for everything to flourish, not just your hickories, you know, sprouting back. So you'll get some buck brush in here, your oaks will regenerate, and it'll just really grow up thick. And if you're hinging up here, you're getting instant cover. Um, the more you can leave, 25%, or sometimes even more, if you can leave that intact, just a higher survival rate those trees will have. That's where a habitat hook will really help you. You can hook those trees with 25 or 30 percent still attached and pull them down small trees like that you can 
you can almost leave 50% on a tree like this. Here's a little different situation. You've got a gigantic oak that's been here for who knows how long, 100 years or more probably. This is what you call a wolf tree. It's a little bit different than the rest of this forest is pretty young. What you would do in this case, or what I would do, is clear everything from the drip edge in toward the trunk. I would clear everything unless it's a tree you really wanted to save, but most of this is, you know, there's a couple of little white oaks over there I might save. But any of this other stuff, all the hickory and that, I would go completely around the canopy of this tree and open this up. And what you're wanting is these oaks to regenerate because eventually this tree's gonna die. They don't live forever. And when that happens, you want some oaks underneath that are coming up that are gonna take its place one day. So I would definitely take out some of these hickory. There's a couple of small red oaks. I would go ahead and cut those. They're overtopped by this one. But eventually this is gonna regenerate. When this one dies, you've got some coming up to take their place. Here's the honey locust. I kill every one of these I find. They're an invasive tree and they'll take over a farm in a hurry. You can either cut it off and treat the outside two inches with either garland or tordon. That'll kill the tree. Or you can double girdle it and then just spray the garland or tordon into the cambium layer. You want to get about 25% of the way into the tree when you girdle them. But just that alone will usually kill it. But these have a tendency to really sprout back. So you want to, you want to treat it with something. The rest of the trees I'm not treating because I want them to sprout back. Your hickories and anything else you're treating, your oaks, or cutting, I mean, any of that other stuff, we just let them sprout back so they have food for the deer, the browse. Here's a nice white oak, the dominant tree right here in this group. I would keep all three of these. I would treat this as one tree versus cutting two of these down and just saving one of them. I would treat this whole thing as, as one tree, even though it's really three separate trunks and then just knock the stuff down around it. Okay, here we've got some cedar mixed in with some oaks right here. And this is really personal preference, subjective, what you want to leave as far as cedars. I tend to leave them because I like the thermal cover. But when you have them mixed in with some oaks, you just got to decide, you know, would you rather have the oak versus the cedars? So right there is a really nice white oak. I would go ahead and take out cedar that's competing with that. But some of these red oaks, and there's a lot of them, I might leave the cedar in some of these spots, just like I said, for the thermal cover. But it's totally up to you on that. If you've got a bunch of oaks already, it don't hurt to take out one or two and, and leave a cedar, but you just gotta, you know, figure out what you have, basically. In this case, the uh, oaks are probably, there's probably too many oaks right in here anyway. You wanna take out some of those little guys that are overtopped. So I might leave a cedar or two. Here's another situation. You've got a white oak versus a, well, it's a red oak family. That might even be a, a black right there. But which one of these do you keep? For me in this forest, like I said before, I want to keep the white oak. But you could also keep both of these and treat them as one tree as well. Knock down some of the red oak and the hickory around them. But I think I would keep that white oak in this, this particular case. And I would go ahead and kill that tree and these red oaks around it. There's an elm. The elm is really almost completely worthless. So I, I take out every elm that I can. But I lost my paint, so I was going to continue to paint the rest of this. We'll go back to a different section where we've done some TSI and we'll talk about some of the different cuts we've done and why we cut it the way we did. So let's go take a look at that. Here's an area that we hinge cut. We tried to create some instant bedding cover in here. We picked spots that they're likely to bed anyway, side hills and points off ridges. This stuff's all sprouting back really well. You can see these hinge cuts like that, that's cut way too far through. We should have stopped, you know, clear back in here at least 25% of that tree. But sometimes you get in a hurry, you know, stock your saw quick enough. And then usually if that's all you got, these trees will die and it's just not a good food source. But if the tree dies, 
Well, it's not blocking the sunlight, so you're going to have some good regeneration too. So, look at all the sprouts coming off this one. That one survived. Down there, I can see some been nipped off. You can tell a lot of the stuff I hinge, they're I'm fairly tall, so the hinge cuts are pretty high. Deer will go under this, won't even slow them down. Now, if you want to block any trails or steer them away from something, you cut them down knee high, you know, between shin and thigh high. Make some steering trails or areas where you want them to avoid. But that's going to wrap it up for today. I appreciate you guys watching. We'll be right back here again next week.